Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Well, many thanks for joining us today on the Journal of Biophilic Design. We're really excited to be joined by Dr. Gemma Jerome. She's Director of Building with Nature. Um, Gemma is an environmental planner with a specialism in the de design, delivery and stewardship of green infrastructure, fellow of the Landscape Institute and also co-chaired the British Standards Institute panel for the, and I'm not even going to say the number, but it was a, a British standard, uh, 86386, yes. blah, blah, blah. Anyway, but <laughs> which is the process for designing and implementing biodiversity net gain. Um, yes. She also recently supported the RTPI RSP be design code um she's also going to be writing for the journal so listeners make sure you do subscribe to the journal of biophilic design make sure you get your hands on a copy so you can have a look and um look out for her articles Gemma sat actually on various government roundtables as well as well as um, advisory panels offering expertise on design quality and is currently supporting the development of the national england green infrastructure standards framework so really excited to have you here Gemma um many thanks for joining us today oh you're so welcome Ness this is brilliant this is a really a pleasure for me um when I heard your introduction which is very kind thank you I just felt instantly very tired I I do <laughs> I do a lot of uh high level strategic work which I do love don't get me wrong um I am passionate about um being an agent for change but this for me is 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 a joy so thanks for having me oh that's lovely um well obviously I have waffled on about what you do so maybe you could uh, <laughs> tell us about yourself um from your own, yeah. um, own sort of words as it were um what yeah, were you interested yeah. in nature as well and um, planning what was the yeah yeah thanks thanks a little bit about me is um I I grew up in in um, the north of England uh the north of Manchester actually in a in a very urban environment just uh, north of the city center um and and really my story is that I I didn't have an early introduction to nature it it came later and my mum tells me that I I was always interested in nature whenever it kind of came across my path. Um, I do remember rescuing worms in the playground uh, when it rained, which it does a lot in Manchester. Um, there'd be this kind of congregation in a circle uh, in the grassy part of the playground because uh, all the worms come up when it rains, don't they? Come to the surface and there'd be a lot of um, kind of primary school age children going and poking. And I remember like running in between their legs to get the worms and I don't know I just instinctually I, I had this kind of protective uh, 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 yeah spirit um, but you know we didn't really do big nature or ecology uh, my nan loved gardens she always had a beautiful garden um, but but again it wasn't something I really had a mentor uh, around it came later so I you know what really got me interested in nature was moving to Scotland and really being mm. in, in big landscapes um, and what that made me realize is I there was like almost a, a, a kind of a hole in my soul like a spiritual uh, missing link to having that daily dose of nature that I then had um, and it made me I had this epiphany I remember digging in the garden uh, we had this little small holding um, me and a group of friends and um, we moved out to the borders of Scotland and we had a we were on a mission to be self-sufficient and um, and it was great fun there was you know gardening all day walking the dog swimming in the river it was off grid it was great but I remember having this epiphany stood in a kind of shoulder height hole we were doing uh, John Seymour's double dig method uh, very old school um what this why why do we have prisons why do we have prisons when people could be gardening <laughs> um, you know <laughs> why don't we support people who are not in education uh, um uh, training or em employment um why you know why aren't we giving everyone a horticultural education and and just this it was for me this like growing up uh, w with lots of uh, interesting people around me, but also very challenged 
environments it yeah it was really clear to me that nature is often the missing link for people to have a purpose or to you know to feel well in themselves um because that's that was my experience it was very therapeutic so that um led me on to discover planning which is all about creating environments where people can then access uh, nature um, as well as you know other things homes housing um, education and so on but yeah that that's kind of uh, in a nutshell um, the, the 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 slightly circuitous route for me to become a, a champion of place and um, and nature yeah that's fantastic well you mentioned that um, worms I did the same thing and I think I've mentioned it on the podcast in the past when I was a kid I also was had I set up the save the worm group or something it was like but they all had little badges and everything and I because and I on my way to school it was very concrete it was very asphalt and everything else but going through like you know up up, up, the, up the massive hill and then down the other hill it was like like tricking Everest you know but um there was there was these worms that were always like kind of like so half some of them were half squished on the pavement or so I was literally picking them up and putting them and then my all my friends I made them all kind of tally how many they'd saved that day <laughs> so I, yeah, so that. I, I know it was the whole worm thing I don't know it must be a thing you know maybe it's because we were we did shorter and lower down and that's the thing that we kind of <laughs> thought that we could rescue yeah yeah I think and there's slightly less um when you're not um, an entomologist and 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 then you know I hang out with a lot of nature nerds now and they can tell me uh not just that that's a spider but what kind of spider it is but when you're not a specialist um I think a worm is instant instantaneously recognizable and a bit less yeah. creepy than other creepy crawlies maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe that's what it is um maybe so what is um obviously you, you're with building with nature um mm. can you tell us about that what it is please and what yeah. it does happy to happy to so this virtual background i've got today this is the build with nature logo in case anyone's wondering it looks pretty abstract because it's zoomed in but um yeah build with nature um yeah i'm so lucky ness like i am um, director um, of Builder Nature, but also a founder of what we do. Um, so I've been with the organization um, from the beginning and actually um, I, I was leading on the, the project that became Builder Nature as an organization. Um, and uh, eight years um, we've been on this journey now to define what good looks like around green infrastructure. So essentially green infrastructure uh, is the way planners talk about nature it's how nature is given a voice and a value and um, and essentially um becomes a specification driver in planning and development um it's in the national planning policy framework and the equivalent frameworks in scotland wales and northern ireland and um, it's absolutely a mandatory requirement now um, in different ways to ensure that nature is part of uh, the design process and i'm I'm so proud to say that we've had um, a part to play in that. Um, essentially, Building with Nature is a, um, a voluntary mechanism. Uh, we have a standards framework, which is 12 quality standards, which you have to use them together. It's not pick and mix. So those 12 standards taken together across the themes of well-being, water and wildlife, they're essentially the holistic design principles which help a whole range of disciplinary specialists, architects, landscape architects, ecologists, engineers, and everyone else who who uh, comes together to 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 make places and to 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 um, care for places in the long term. Um, they, they essentially we've brought together uh, the ingredients to to high quality place making and place keeping. So the standards framework does that. It defines um, high quality green infrastructure, which includes blue infrastructure. So it's parks, gardens, um, biodiversity interventions, from the small scale to the large scale on the green. And it's also the blue features as well. So canals, rivers, coastal, it's it, again, small scale to large scale. And it's, it's everything that um, we might consider as um, ecosystem services, uh, nature-based interventions. How do we how do we survive and thrive as, as a species? Um, and and Builder Nature would say that we need to prioritize in our design process, starting with the land, starting with nature and, and all of the multi 
um, species involved in that, the community of species, which includes humans, but we're just one of. So it's the more than human um, picture that we're interested in. And just we also um, we keep the standards framework open source. We work in a in a cross sector way so uh, our standards board is made up of some brilliant um uh, green infrastructure experts um from government from industry from the professional membership bodies um we also run and manage an accreditation system because we decided early on that there's so much guidance out there we don't want to reinvent the wheel or frustrate or duplicate um, um, by just repeating what's already been done. So the best way to think about Builder Nature instead is it's a one-stop shop for all of the sexual knowledge and expertise around, for example, nature recovery, uh, sustainable water management through natural um, and nature-based solutions, uh, well-being and access and inclusivity around green spaces and open spaces, all pulled into one area. And if you want to get the recognition that you are following those standards and you've you've baked them into your design approach we provide uh, assessment and auditing of that so the builder nature award scheme is where people can get that external verification and tell the story of what they've done um, and then be able to uh, you know to share that learning and really uh, reassure the, the key stakeholders that would want better outcomes for people and wildlife. So it might be the community who want reassurance that a new development has thought about uh, all the things that they care about. It might be the local authority that wants some external verification of quality uh, in line with policy guidance. It might be investors who are increasingly thinking about environmental, social governance and, and having measurable um, uh, and, and metric based uh, methodologies of, of how they can be sure that they are contributing to long-term improvements in light of the race to net zero and nature recovery. And also we are increasingly talking about um, public health um, crises and, and how nature can support um, people's health and well-being as well. So yeah, Builder Nature is in that nexus. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we are a voluntary mechanism, but we do work alongside design teams and local authorities for specific uh, development proposals that are coming forward. Um, and just, yeah, if people are interested, how does this fit with some of those other big uh, levers like biodiversity net gain? We're, we work closely with the likes of DEFRA, Natural England, Scottish Government, Welsh Government to ensure that we're not diverging from any of that. We are um, complementing, supplementing and, and ultimately what, what we're interested in is making the how easier. Um, so I think uh, in a nutshell, uh, the government, it's the government's duty to, to, to describe what we need to do and sometimes when, by, uh, with targets. But it, it actually is for experts from industry and from the ground up to help everybody around them to understand how to do it. And, and that's what we're here to do. I think it's fantastic. Do you think the people that you're speaking to, are they are they kind of understanding more i mean obviously you you know the 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 planners or the builders and the 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 ones that are creating new housing estates and things do they do they really understand there's a better way of designing um you know and planning or do they is there is there a genuine kind of desire to do something different yeah, yeah. it's a really interesting question um yeah, I mean, th this is a whole conversation itself, but I'll give my top level um, insights. Um, when I started um, Building with Nature, in the early days, we started with a research question. So it was a it was a research problem. How do we support industry to deliver against what were fairly, even back in 2015, clearly defined um, objectives at the national government level to deliver green infrastructure as one of the pri priority um, outcomes for people and nature through the planning process. And yet we were not seeing that consistent and effective delivery on the ground. So we started with that premise, what's stopping people? What's the obstacle? What's the barrier? Um, and how can we help with that? And 
you know, we heard really clearly, we, you know, one of the main things I did over the first two years of this, of, of, of developing the standards was just have conversations. I was in listening mode. It was, you know, it was, it was about making sure we understood the problem. Um, and this is very permaculture, actually. The, the solution is often in the problem. If you focus on the, on the, on the problem for long enough, the solution will emerge. It will show itself to you. Um, uh, you know, and, and if you, for example, get a new uh, garden, garden or an allotment watch for a year that's what they say you know the best practice approach is to watch it through all seasons and then you'll actually understand what the opportunities and constraints of that small piece of land are and we rarely do that in real time with development you know it's it's this there's this real kind of uh, rush to, uh, to to bring forward a master plan, to approve that master plan, to get going you know and construct and implement and then a majority of those stakeholders leave and then we're left with this new landscape and this new place that we need to develop a relationship with as a community and, and steward over time. So one of the things we understood really clearly is there was one of the problems was this uh, focus on the front end. A lot of people's time, resource and budgets were focused up to that point of getting planning approval there's loads of people around the table and there's quite a lot of money um sloshing around not always you know we're talking about certain scale of development you know there are smaller developments who are on much tighter um but um budget constraints but they are also working to quite tight time constraints as well so we we found that there was a, because of these pressures of time and money one of the big asks uh, of home builders and developers was please make it simple tell us how to do it it feels complicated and we were saying it's not it's a perception that it's complicated if this is if this is baked in early in the process if you start with nature instead of at the end of the process going oh god we didn't think about that and now we've got to kind of stop everything and it's going to cost us a lot more money because we're having to rectify then we you know we need to kind of actually uh support people who are not ecological experts and the not you know those non-specialists in the home builder and developer camp to actually understand the importance of nature and the value of nature but to do it in a way that is um, aligned with their language and also their values and to use the other meaning of that word it often is value driven it's about viability it's about profit margins it's about return on investment and um, you know a lot of developers are buying land at risk um, you know at their own cost um, and so getting planning approval is a very important stage for them so it's not to contradict any of um, what they see as their priorities it's to reframe what our priorities are as as the voice of nature and and kind of speak that back to them in a language that they then understand isn't in conflict with what they want actually a high value development will have nature integrated into its design approach and i think what has also changed in the past 5 years um is we now have bigger legislative and policy drivers for this as well. So we're kind of in a space now where nature is something everybody is um, interested in because they have to be, because actually it's a mandatory legal requirement. So I would say the solution from our point of view is the same, let us help you understand what nature needs so you can then build that into your design approach. That's, that's great. I think legislation, standards, all these things just add extra weight, doesn't it? And like you say, um, from the conversation I had literally just for just half an hour before I was on the um, on this call with you, the, you know, there was we were talk, chatting about, well, how do we get people to really understand and make that change and make that difference? And and you've just said exactly that they don't un they don't understand. So like, tell us, make it simple. We yeah. know what do we have to do. And, and it isn't it isn't rocket science, is it really? But if you don't know, you don't know. 
but yeah. having simple guidelines and and like a proper standard that you can adhere to um mm-hmm. as a builder i mean you've got like, so many things to worry about i mean it's like these are massive massive um, infrastructure jobs aren't they mm-hmm. um you know it's not like just putting a fence you know fence panel up and worrying about you know sticking a concrete you know thing in the hole or whatever obviously we don't want concrete mm-hmm. but you know um <laughs> um I mean can you can you share with us a success maybe is there you know do you have any like do you have a case study or do you have like um something which um people who have maybe signed or you know you know who has followed the the standards um, Mm -hmm. and is actually made a difference to the space or to the way they've approached their planning um you know what does that space look like in the community as well yeah, sure. Um, we've got some brilliant case studies on our website, and and encourage any of your listeners to go across to our website and just have a have a a look around. Um, in the project section, you can actually uh, filter projects by region. So if you if you're based in a particular region and you want to see a builder nature award scheme in your area, you can do that. I mean, a, a particular project I'm really proud of. Um, I'll just uh, flag um Queensland Court and Gardens in Glasgow. Um, so I'm very Kind of based on what I already said about where I've come and my background, I'm very interested in retrofit. I'm I'm interested in how we bring nature to people who actually serve to benefit the most. So there's a it's probably a, a well known statistic for your readers um, who are engaged in these subjects already. But there's a there's a direct correlation between people who need access to nature because of health and social inequalities and um, people who have the least access. So um, essentially, um, uh, provision of high quality green infrastructure is is lowest in areas that have the label of deprivation and, and have communities of individuals who would benefit most from that daily dose of nature that I talked about earlier. And there's studies um, to, to show that really clearly. So um, I, I'm proud of Queens and Court and Gardens um, and I would you know give the kudos to the team. Um, uh, we simply come around come along and we validated uh, their approach through our assessment and audit. It's a project um, that is a partnership between um, uh, Southside Housing Association in Glasgow. Um, They worked with um, Glasgow City Council, um, Stantec uh, and and NatureScot, which is um, uh, the the, um, environment um, government um, agency in Scotland, so the equivalent of Natural England. They um, uh, worked with a landscape um, consultancy called Rayburn Farquhar Bowen, who I really uh, recommend looking at their work. Um, every project I've worked with them on is 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 absolute um, uh, exemplary standard of understanding the holistic nature uh, of of landscape as a, a route to really uh, supporting flourishing communities. And what we've got at Queensland Court is two multis, which is um, uh, a Scottish way of, of describing um, essentially apartment blocks. Um, so two multis in an area of existing green space, which is um, is fairly low grade grassland. Um, but the but the driver of the project is that whole sections of the site flood regularly. So what should be an area of multifunctional green space for the community of uh, of, of those t- uh, two residents residential blocks to use is often unusable. Um, So Glasgow City Council had some funding around sustainable drainage and they, rather than just doing a technical or engineering led solution, they worked with the team at Raven Farquhar Bowen to do a place a, a place transformation approach where they considered what are the play opportunities, what are the biodiversity opportunities, what are the wider amenity addressing social isolation opportunities, and that really kind of multi-user co-design approach. And um, they've come up with um, what will what is going to be a brilliant design. We've looked at the master plan, we've signed off the master plan, and we're going to be working with them at the next stage, I hope, um, to see that through to delivery and then um, a, a commitment to that long-term stewardship. But, you know, they, they, there was a lot of meaningful community engagement, um, some in, in initial uh, installation of rain gardens connected to the buildings that really ensured 
everybody was brought on that journey um, with, with the design team. So um, instead of the design being done to those residents, it was a case of we want to work with you. And that often um, is something that's overlooked. It's getting better. Um, and there are great um, bodies like the Association of Collaborative uh, Design um, uh, that talk about what does co-design and particip participatory design good practice look like how do we ensure retrofit and regen projects are equitable and um and i think that's a key part of of of, of green infrastructure um design as well so yeah um that's one example that um springs to mind when you ask about good case studies that's that's great um i you know i, I think that's when and you mentioned earlier on about the people can go to your website which is what was the website called so we can just mention it if people listen yeah it's um builderinature.org.uk that's lovely. So you can go on there and go to projects and um, and then look at um, all the different case studies that are on there. Um, I think you've you made you hit the nail on the head, really. I think it's the whole community engagement thing. It's it's not just like somebody goes along, goes, we're doing this to you. This mm -hmm. is the space you actually is, there's also that element of ownership, isn't it? When people feel like they've been engaged with something, even you yes. talk to workplace designers and the more engagement you can get with the workforce, the more likely they are to to activate those spaces and use them yes. and feel like they can use the spaces as well. Yes. That's another thing, isn't it? You can create yes. a lovely green space, but if their mindset is, well, it's not for us, it's for them. Yeah. then they're not going to go and use it i know before, exactly yeah you're really passionate about equity and about sort of everybody having access to to nature uh which which i am too and i i think we do need to open up that access uh to everybody and at scale do you think there's still a real issue uh you mm -hmm. know in in this do you think that there's almost like people are just paying so i mean obviously not the ones who are adhering to the standards that you're doing and obviously that's the whole mm -hmm. point of what you're doing but generally, do you think that there is a people want to do it, but they're kind of playing lip service to it? It's like even even some of the home building, you know, these new new builds that I've seen gone up, which tick, seem to tick a lot of boxes and they're planting trees and all this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. the houses hardly have any gardens, have hardly any space and they're all piled into each other. And yeah. where do the kids go and play? Well, they have to cross the roads, go over there to get to the green space, which they can do. But, you know, and then it's so. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's more, you know, that's just yeah. probably just a few that I've seen, but there are some amazing examples. I know there are, but do you feel generally that um, that that we obviously we need to do this at scale? Um, but do you feel that there's sort of a real issue, this? that? Um... Yeah, um, I think the, the short answer is yes. I think there is a long way to go. Um, I think we are now seeing, um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, we're seeing standards, we're seeing standards at the national level, we're seeing standards emerge at the regional and local level, and that's great. Um, but I would say what good looks like, it has to be context led. So what good looks like for one development needs to be led by the character of that landscape, the character of that community, um, talking about inclusion, every community has strengths as well as needs. We often talk about community needs and we talk in the language of deficit around communities. And I just, I'm a big champion for um, the index of multiple celebration alongside the index of multiple deprivation. And I think designers um, and probably a lot of people listening to your podcast who are creative experts and champions for the creative process will be with me on this that actually it's that it's that process of design which needs to be as open as possible to all opportunities as as well as mindful of constraints um to ensure that the eventual delivery and the outputs and outcomes are meaningful and like you say have buy-in you know that that word really for me it's about belonging um and and that people see themselves mirrored back um the things that they said in that statutory consultation uh, exercise or series of workshops they can see you know what's changed that i said this and this is you know now what's been done it needs to be meaningful it needs to be um uh, honest and i think there's still a big issue uh, around 
including the voices and lived experience of vulnerable and marginalized groups. So that's something we uh, push for in our standards. I was at a workshop yesterday with a group in Bristol, a, a group of disabled people and uh, a, a group of researchers from uh, the University West of England. And it was very, very enlightening to hear, even when there is, as using your words, lip service or boxes that are intended to be ticked, checklists, for example, at the local level around um, uh, um, inclusion. It doesn't, community consultation exercises and design approaches still don't necessarily ensure that the actual voices of disabled people and other marginalized and excluded groups are part of the, the design um, process um, because we can refer out to good industry practice um, and standards and we should also do that, but there is something else, uh, something richer um, that's added when we actually listen to people um, who can tell us firsthand um, uh, what their experiences are of accessing green and blue space. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think there's a long way to go. There are some great examples of great projects and great design teams out there who are working in a more, I would say, uh, evolved or uh, open-minded uh, way. So there's an, a, a kind of collection of consultancies and um, design consultancies that I'm um, talking to who are very focused on regenerative design and, and regenerative practice and actually making their practice um, um, an organization regenerative. And just for any listeners that that might be a new concept for um, my simple understanding of regenerative versus sustainable is sustainable is is making sure um you're um you're not doing any damage so you're kind of getting to um if you like uh, a baseline of, of of zero and therefore we can sustain ourselves and it feels a little bit more survivability more and more than sustainability when we've got record temperatures last week it was the highest temperature on record across the world uh, when we've got flooding you know incredible videos because we now have social media platforms that we're all plugged into 24 7 incredible shocking videos of flooding in in Spain and and of course other parts of the world but that feels you know, very close to home. Last year, it was uh, London. We regularly have UK flooding. So when it's right in our face, um, it feels even more pressing um, that we are not just looking at how do we survive? Um, we actually need to think of how do we leave the world in a better place? So how do we become good ancestors? Um, and in building the voices of the more than humans into our design processes, I feel like that's what your whole mission um, at, at the Journal of Biophilic Design is, Ness, um, not to put words in your mouth, but we've had a couple of good conversations now. It's it's how do we, you know, get nature as a client around the table, as I heard it said recently, which I thought was a great way of describing what I believe we're both invested in. So that regenerative approach, that renaturing approach. Um, and I think just one thing, other thing, which I'm really passionate about is, is stewardship. If we don't, as you say, get everybody... Okay, I don't want to sound naive. It will be impossible in any planning and design process to get literally everybody's view in, in, involved. But there, I do think a lot of people could do more than, even if it means crunching the data from the census, who is in this area? Who's not turning up to my to my um, workshop uh, that, you know, is on a Monday afternoon? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's about ensuring that whatever we leave behind as designers is, is, is not just usable, but that people enjoy using it and a smaller um, amount of those people feel invited and welcomed to be actively engaged in the ongoing stewardship of those spaces and that then they can be adapted to suit the needs of changing communities. You know, we design for one community that will change. People grow older and um, people who aren't disabled now may become disabled. And um, the, the, the cultural and social um, demographics of a community will inevitably change over time as people move around. You know, we're going to have more climate um, migrants and, and you know, many, many reasons that things will change. So we just need our 
spaces, our bi biophilic spaces, to be adaptable um, to 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 changing, um, yeah, to changing needs. I think what you mentioned about nature as a client around the table, I think that's one of the key things. If we think about that every time we, we put um, spade in ground or before we put spade in ground, you know, when that's when that's going to happen, that we really look at the landscape, we really look at that thing and we invite nature to the table um, mm. because, um, you know, we are nature, we are part of yeah. it. You know, and we, we forget that, you know, we, we're kind of going to cut ourselves off from it. It's bonkers. Yeah. Um, really um, and I think like the sort of the whole thing of you said about the sort of steward stewardship and and everybody and actually I just you know when the, the word stewardship when you mentioned it and I, I was I, th I think if everybody took ownership of something it's like like years ago isn't it I mean I remember my mother saying that you know they, she was in the inner city London and and you know everybody kind of like looked out for everybody else but they all kind of, you know, they had their plants, they had their gardens, they all shared the vegetables that they grew, you know, in their, or if they had an allotment, then, you know, people come back. You, you're finding more and more of that happening now. And I, I, and I, and I love that. I love the fact that the world is one big family. And I love the fact that we can all share something, um, whether that's a moment under a tree or it's somebody's lettuces, yeah. you know, yeah. um, I mean, one of the great friendships that I was, I've sort of developed actually is um, a family from Hungary who've now gone back to Hungary, but I was just walking back home one day. I was on the phone. I come off the phone. They, this, this whole, this chap was on the phone and he just, he was obviously new to the area and he just said, would you like some lettuces and I'm like oh so it was from our allotment and then it became one thing led to another and then it just it was just from that gift giving of food of something that was from the earth that was just so simple and free really yeah. um yeah. it was it was lovely and I just the more you talk to people and then there's so much of that going on and and you know I know I asked the question about you know you know are there challenges and, and it is a real issue and all these things but there's so much good going on there is so much wonderful stuff and like they say the case studies on your website are going to attest to that um so yeah I, I'm, I'm 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 doing this because I mean I'm I'm optimistic because uh, mm. I know that there is a change and and I, I think that um, by bringing everybody together, it's just going to snowball that and just put the foot on the accelerator. Um, you know, people are doing such fantastic stuff. And I think also it's, it's also to keep people buoyed up because yeah. think, oh, that's going on. Oh, that's going on. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Oh, I can connect with those guys and, you know, make something better. Um I did want to I did want to ask you and I want to sort of just just go back a little bit on your own sort of personal journey. You mentioned that you did some research for your, um, I think it was your master's, um, when you looked at how small pockets of land could be transformed and then joined together to create a sort of much larger natural green space. I, I actually yeah. absolutely blinking love that. Um, <laughs> you know, I really, and I, you know, the whole thing about people having gardens and then your next door neighbor putting like, you know, asphalt and concrete down so they can plant their cars on and then mm -hmm. mowing the lawn to the inch of its life without, you know, and there's no biodiversity or anything. So these poor little creatures are kind of like going, oh, I've got nowhere to go. Uh, oh, okay, I can jump over there. And But obviously the bigger picture, if you've got a city with lots and lots of concrete, there's no wildlife corridors, there's no space for them to go. So when you told me, when you were saying about that was your research. So yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm sort of waffling on, but I, I do, I would like you to tell me a little bit or tell our listeners as well, a little bit about yeah. where that was coming from and, and what, what you were researching and, and what did you find? Great, okay, yeah, happy to. So yeah, so um. It started this this research focus started with my masters, but it continued. Um, I got I got the, the 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 appetite, the bug for it, as they say. I I carried it on into my PhD, so it, it became my life for five years, really six years with the masters, and um, so it's something I'm very passionate about on a on a personal level, and it it does come through my work with Builder Nature, but Builder Nature is much more holistic framework and includes that community scale, but not 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 exclusively so the the the, the academic um research that i uh, was leading on in in liverpool so it was collecting data from the 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 area that is covered by the mersey forest and um, so i was working in partnership with the mersey forest which is a national community forest organization they're based in in warrington but they cover the merseyside area and do fantastic work introducing community members and 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 setting up friends groups and and looking at uh, thinking about stewardship but they also have expertise in in in, in forestry and woodland management and green infrastructure but they were interested in me working with them to essentially as you started to explain map out all of the 
micro scale, small scale and micro scale projects across the Merseyside area and um, that geography. Um, so we're interested in communities of geography, but also communities of interest. Map out all the projects that might be otherwise insignificant in terms of delivering ecosystem services in terms of being on the radar of the planning authority so we're talking community gardens we're talking uh greening alleyway projects we're talking small um friends groups who look after patches of woodland patches of you know brownfield meanwhile space and um, sometimes it might be more ad hoc groups like foraging groups or groups that have got together to defend uh, a scrappy bit of space from development you know everything all of the above um, and what I did is create a, a definition a way of framing all of that to give it status because I believed it deserved status um, because it was actually giving people a, an active uh, and sometimes activist uh, uh, role and, and, and status in their local community um, I called it community scale green infrastructure because it was it was kind of, like I say it was kind of falling outside the the, the 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 definition and parameters of green infrastructure in planning terms. But I believe that cumulatively, when I say I believe that you know the the focus of the research was to substantiate this for evidence and and kind of data collection analysis. Um, but the, you know it, it was it was instinctually clear to me that the cumulative impact of all of these projects. Um, both from a nature recovery angle and I was particularly interested in the social capital and community recovery angle that they were statistically significant that they you know if if they were seen as a, a network um, and if they could be brought together um, it, it, it you know it they would actually have um, more uh, of, of a substantive impact on decisions around policy and, and resource and funding um, I was also, and this is might be a pattern some of your readers recognise, um, through my own volunteer work in um, in the area of nature conservation and 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 kind of environmental stewardship, I noticed common pattern of um, a couple of very strong personalities, what I what I call champions, coming forward to lead a group, to lead a new project. Um, they would become like the sometimes the gateway, but that can be positive and negative, but almost like the center, the, the center of uh, of a group's um energy, the nucleus. And that would often be the difference between a group having longevity and resilience and not. Um, but there was the pattern was around a lack of succession. And then these individuals, they're leaders for a while, but they take on everything and they don't think about succession and they burn out. And then the project collapses because those key personalities and individuals are no longer there. Um, and this, I saw this time and time and time again, even in more formal projects like school gardens, there was the, um, the big lottery fund had a, a local food uh, focus at the time. Um, and so many school gardens popped up and it was an enthusiastic teacher, you know, driving it. Mm. And then they, you know, got, got moved or uh you know they just ran out of steam too much marking to do and then we we had this almost this um uh like trail of not destruction but these kind of forgotten overgrown school gardens across the country i just thought it was fascinating so what i was really interested in is how do we support those those individuals and those those groups to be more resilient to have more longevity in light of the social and environmental um, outcomes that they were delivering um, and it, I mean yeah it was it was it was a privilege to lead on that research and um, there's been I think successive uh, 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 waves of, of, of focus and in 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 uh, in, in, in research and and um, uh, also policy guidance since then but I, what I one thing I will say just to finish off Ness is that at the time I was particularly critical of this idea that um, so it was the coalition government at the time and it was the start of austerity. We're now 15 years into austerity and public sector funding cuts. Um, but there was this big this this big society idea that um, in the absence of there being public sector funding for parks, for green spaces, it's OK 
Uh, you can hear the cynicism in my voice. Uh, it's okay because uh, community volunteers will step in if they really care about that green space and that park. Surely they'll just step in. And instinctively, every you know fiber of my being knew that was a complete misconstruction and misunderstanding of why people volunteered. And also, uh, actually, quite offensive to all of the professionals out there who are skilled in not only managing volunteers but um, the the the. The, the, the physical land-based skills that are uh, critical to, to, to making spaces functional and safe and, and, and beautiful and, and ecologically um, uh, vibrant. So um, I wanted to refute that idea. And I think there's a little bit of that idea coming back um, that we need to be really careful about. Um, so those anchor organizations that have those skills to support volunteers, I'm a big advocate of partnership approaches when it comes to stewardship. And so so one of the things that Building Nature talks really clearly about is if you if we if you design something bells and whistles incredible when it comes to green and blue infrastructure, please think about stewardship from the beginning. Think about how that space will be managed, maintained, monitored, remediated into the long term. We're talking here minimum 30 years, ideally in perpetuity. Design it to be commensurate proportionate to the level of funding resource and so on and skills and knowledge that you'll be able to throw at it from the point of completion um on the on the on 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 the construction so yeah there's more to say about that it's a whole conversation itself but that's a bit of a, a kind of update on where that story's got to <laughs> That's, that's lovely. And, and I, we are, are definitely going to get you back on. Um, and I think, can you be the environment minister, please? Uh, can, can we can we just like kick out what's going on and start again, please? Anyway, but that's, but that's again, that's even a, probably a third conversation. But um, before I ask you the final question um, and um, Gemma, I, you know, is there anything else that you'd like to add before before I get to that final magic question? <laughs> um, gosh, it, you know, I'm just... I think we, you know, I, I often get put in 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 the role of of expert, um, and you know, I, I have an ego like everyone else, um, <laughs> but I, you know, and that's fine. But I think I'm. I just want to, and this isn't a, you know, I'm being absolutely authentic and genuine. I say this, I'm in listening mode as much as possible. I think we, you know, and actually even. <laughs> Definitely, when it comes to my colleagues, um, I'm I'm constantly learning and listening, and 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 it makes it makes my life more manageable actually. Because I think if you stay in if you stay in the in the mode of curiosity and in that learning mode, um, and you know avoid think, thinking you know anything or everything, um, it it it's I think it's incredibly important um, when we're in um, such an age of uncertainty and uh, and and you know, you said earlier, we need to be careful around burnout, we need to be careful around climate anxiety. Um, and, you know, we there's so much to be concerned about. But I really feel strongly that we do have the solutions if we work together, and we think creatively and, um and, you know, it's not all going to be over in the blink of an eye, you know, uh, well, let's not get into kind of science fiction and, and what might happen around as, you know stray asteroids and stuff um, but what i mean is this transition we need to make as a species bringing other species with us will be will be very long and steady um and we need you know it's a marathon not a sprint so we we do need to continue to work together and i, I also am in listening mode when i'm kind of off you know what would i say like not at work so one of the things that makes me a champion for nature is because I'm looking and listening and 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 having my senses active when I'm in nature, and that is the biggest teacher for me. Um, a lot of what I do is about reading the landscape and reading the land. And I think if you speak to any natural and maybe even built environment specialist, and you you know you you kind of pushed them for long enough, they would get back to that place of you know, I'm I'm here to to make things better, and a, a big route I think to do that is to look at um, what nature. I mean, biophilic design. It, it's look at look at how um, how you know how complex and and brilliant and beautiful nature is, and try in a small way 
um, and, and hopefully in a consistent way to to build that into our design approaches. Um, yeah, sorry, slightly clumsy uh, way of trying to describe something really important and complex. Yeah. <laughs> you, did a, you did a blinky good job there. Um, I think that's lovely. Um, yeah, reading the land, listening, staying mm -hmm. curious, all those good things. Um, I think it's very inspiring what you said, actually. So, um, so Gemma, final question. If you could paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia, what would it look like? And I, you can't, you have no idea how much I'm looking forward to hearing what you say. <laughs> oh wow! Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I have, I have got something I want to say. Now, I can't take credit for this. So this is, this is actually one of the first things um, my partner ever said to me in one of our first conversations, and I, I. They're not a built environment professional, um, um, but they they are um, a, a, a student of nature. Uh, they love going on walks with me because they say I'm like an app. That's so like, just like, I love like, impressing them with my amateur level knowledge of naturalism. But um, <laughs> yeah, so it's a simple thing um, that I think is an incredible um, um, insight that they've had um um in 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 their experience of the world to date which i think actually is is it, it could be a universal philosophy for life and um, what they said to me is that really what everybody needs is community connection and love and i i couldn't i can't fault that and you know i've sat with it for for years now and i and i and whether it's in a professional setting or a personal setting and, and ideally you know we can bring our to use some jargon but we can bring our whole selves to work um especially when we're you know is it john lennon who said if you do the work you love you never work a day in your life and i feel like that's what you're doing this i feel like that's what i'm doing and so when we're thinking about biophilic design it's i want people to or i speak for myself i aspire to do that in a way that keeps those um values of community connection and love at the front of my thinking and i believe that's how we bring everyone along with us um whether you're talking about somebody with the illness of addiction whether you're talking about um somebody who's trying to grapple with uh, some really technical um technological aspects of, of meeting um uh, carbon um, um net zero carbon you know what whoever you might be working with when you boil it down, everybody needs to feel like they're part of a community. Everybody needs to feel connected to each other and to, to the land. And and love, um, you know, is uh, it's not a word that is used much in our sector. Um, but actually, I think it, it is the thing that drives a lot of, of, of what we do and, and why we do it. So if we can bring those values um, through our work, um, uh, including our work where we are championing each other, giving voice to those who don't have a voice, including nature, then I think what we create together is more likely to be uh, regenerative um, and fair and, um, and, and yeah, um, uh, yeah, um, that's probably it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.